Welcome back. We're opening our Bibles to the book of Daniel. So if, uh, unless you are quick at finding it, if you go to the middle of your Bible, you'll see the book of Psalms. Usually it's right at the middle. Just look at the middle of your Bible. Then after the book of Psalms, you'll be moving towards the New Testament. You'll see Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then Daniel. We're looking at Daniel chapter 3. We're going to read the whole chapter, the whole story. Uh, we heard the synopsis, the summary of the story from Kor a little earlier. We're going to go back through that story uh, as we continue our journey of living in exile. We are all in exile. We are away from family and friends, at least away in that we can't be physically close. We are away from the family, the place of worship here. We are in exile from normal, quote-unquote, what was once normal life. How now do we live? How do we live by trusting in God alone? Will you pray with me before we enter into God's word? Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here. Thank you for your word that we can hold in our hands. Whether it is the physical book or whether it's with a tablet or a computer or a smartphone, that we can access your word freely and openly. We pray, Lord, bless us in the reading, the hearing, the understanding, that we may grow in our walk with you, in our trust of you. In Christ we pray. Amen. Daniel chapter 3. We're going to read through that, but I'm going to ask you to pause with me. Uh, we're going to look at these different sections within. We're going to make some pauses along the way, highlight some things that we're seeing. I didn't want to go through the entire chapter and then come back again, and I pray that this will be a blessing for all of us. King Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, this is verse 1, made an image of gold 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Just pause there with me. Put your finger in your Bible. Hang on to that spot. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high. If you've got those notes in the bottom of your Bible, you're going to see 90 feet high. For those of us who are looking at this in the metric system, 27 and a half meters high. For those of us who can't quite fathom how long that is, think of this being an almost, almost 10-story building. This, this image, this image, this made image of gold 10 stories high. Huge. Made there out on the plains and interestingly made completely of gold. Why? Well, in an interesting side story, if, open your, if you've got your Bibles, go back into chapter 2. We didn't do this story. It's not really part of it, but it has an impact on our story. Chapter 2 is Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He has this dream, and he wants all of the smart people in Babylon to tell him what this dream is and then explain the dream. Nobody can do it except for Daniel. Daniel is blessed with the message of that dream by God, and he's able to explain that dream to Nebuchadnezzar. And, and here is the explanation of that dream. Chapter 2, verse 31. Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. Ten stories high, I wonder? The head of the statue was made of pure gold, the chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but no human hands, but, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of clay, of iron and clay, and smashed them. The iron and clay... The iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. 
The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. In verse 39, it says, After you, Daniel's explaining it to the king, after you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours, the gold then going down to the body and to the feet. And then in verse 44, it continues, In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. That stone that becomes the mountain. Nebuchadnezzar hears this proclamation, this interpretation of this dream, and he says to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings, and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Wonderful testimony to Daniel. And Daniel gets promoted because of that. And and here we have King Nebuchadnezzar giving the wonder at the explanation of this dream. But perhaps, I have to wonder, fighting the description of that dream as our story unfolds. Because you'll note that the head was made of gold, and that is Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, and then the other kingdoms that follow become those other metals and the clay feet. And he makes the image of complete clay, of complete gold. This is the image that he is making the testimony will stand forever. It will not be brought down. It will be there forever because he is the conquering king. He is the all-powerful. His kingdom, he is claiming, will never fail. So he makes that image of gold 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Verse 2, he then summoned the satraps, the prefects, the governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. All those who had been conquered, all those who are under the leadership of King Nebuchadnezzar are called to this plain to worship this idol. The satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. And then the herald loudly proclaimed, he made this decree, nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kind of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Immediately, they fall down in worship. No questions. At one end, you've got this, this ten-story statue to stand and fall down in worship. At the other, if you refuse to do that, you've got this fiery furnace heated up and ready to go. Verse 8. We have this accusation that comes. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And all whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace." But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. They have come into this place 
and they are in your midst, and they are not worshiping you or this gold statue that you have set up. They aren't doing this. They aren't bowing down as you have called them to do. They are rejecting you. They are turning their way against you. How can you even trust them if they don't worship you, commit themselves to you? This is an interesting fact that has plagued Christianity and Christians throughout time. This is something that came up even in the time of Rome in Christ in the New Testament. You see, the problem here for Nebuchadnezzar isn't that they worship Jehovah, Yahweh, God. It's that they won't worship these other gods, that they won't bow down to King Nebuchadnezzar, that they won't bow down to this idol, but worship God alone. In, in Rome, we had the same kind of thing happening. The Roman Empire was fine, as Christians could be in their presence. They could be there, but when they did not, re- when they refused to worship the gods, when they refused to worship Caesar, that's when the problem came. Some, I had read, even referred to them as being atheists. Interesting. They came down but they would only worship God. They would not worship anyone else. Uh, Stephen Vanderveen, uh, he, 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 wrote, he, he wrote a sermon on this, and in that sermon he, he refers, and I'm just going to borrow his reference there, to, to a bishop, Polycarp, who was martyred in A.D. 168. He, he was arrested and brought into the stadium, and the proconsul urged this old man Swear and I will set you free. Reject Christ. But Polycarp declared, 86 years I have served him and he has never done me harm. How could I reject my king and my savior? Again, he was threatened by being burned alive and Polycarp said, You threaten me with fire that will burn for an hour, and after a little while it will be quenched, but you are unaware of the fire of the judgment to come, and the fire of eternal punishment that which is kept for the ungodly. He took that stand, and he paid for it with his life. The same kind of accusation is coming before Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They are being threatened for not worshiping these other gods, for not worshiping Nebuchadnezzar, for staying only and worshiping our God and Father. Verse 13. We have the threat that comes from the king. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound, the horn, the flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made very I made very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then, what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Then, what God will be able to rescue you from my hand. There is your words of challenge. The words kind of similar to Pharaoh. I am the greatest. There is no other God as good as me. Here, there, what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? I am the king. I am the emperor. I am the ruler. What God can save you from my hand? From me and the power that I have. What God will be able to rescue you from that fiery furnace? Wow. And here we have the trust that comes from Shadrach, 
Meshach, and Abednego. They replied to the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. Now, just just remember who these three gentlemen are. Uh, These were boys taken from their families out of Israel, taken as young boys. They were the smart ones, the good-looking ones, the best of the crop. They were taught, some would say indoctrinated, into the Babylonian faith for three years, separated from family, separated from the gospel, from the five books of Moses, from the teachings from the Torah. They were separated from all of those things. They were able to witness God's blessing and provision for them when they went on their special diet. They were able to possibly, probably hear the news through Daniel that took place in the dream. They were there and they saw where God seemed to let Israel down. They were there where they saw God being faithful to them. It's understandable, I would imagine, for them to wonder just a little bit. They said, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But, but, look at what comes there in verse 18. But, Even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Even if God will not protect them, even if God will not provide them, they are making the choice with whom they are putting their trust and they have made it with God. A confident decision. A decision being made in faith. A decision that I have to believe being made by the spurring of God's Spirit within them. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was furious face turned red, angry, furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as if they're going to run away and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, Trousers, turbans, and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the fire so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace." These soldiers throwing them in die because the heat is so high, and yet they're throwing these men in. And you would think, with their clothes wrapped around them, with the ropes tying them together, that before they were able to even get past the doorway of this furnace, that they would be torched on fire. A horrific scene. But a picture that King Nebuchadnezzar expected to see. A horrible death. But then in verse 24, the king, then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in, am- in amazement and he asked his advisors, weren't these three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? So these are the very same advisors back in verse 8 who accused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These are the same advisors who accused and made the testimony against them are now 
testifying to what they see. They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like the Son of God. A couple things. First, we see the three men being thrown into this fiery furnace, and then all of a sudden there's a fourth. There is speculation as to, is this Jesus before his incarnation? Is this the Spirit of God? Is this an angel? We don't really know. There are, there are stories and there are ways to pull that through. The reality is, is that God is with them, and he is present with them in the fire. Listen to these words that come from Isaiah 41, verse 10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. A little later, verse chapter 43, verse 2 in Isaiah. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep you over. When you walk through the fire... You will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. He is with them, and He is with them in the fire. You and I will look at that and say, well, wait a minute. If I am thrown into this fiery furnace that is blowing seven times hotter, that this this, this fiery furnace is as hot as it can be, if you're going to save me, come and get me and take me out of that furnace and put me somewhere safe. Take me out of the heat and help me to get to where I can be where it's cool once again. Uh, They weren't taken out. God is with them and the man is walking around in the fire together. And and it tells us that they were unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like the son of the gods. Kind of an interesting note. Where, where I would want to be taken out, God comes to where they are and stays with them and gives them the protection in the midst of the flames. Nebuchadnezzar, verse 26, then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. Somehow, over the roar of the flames, they were able to hear. And so they came. They came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them, and they saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was the hair on their heads singed. (laughs) You know what that's like. If you've set a fire or started a barbecue, you don't even have to get into the flame in order for the hair on your hands and arms to singe. We've all had that story, trying to get the barbecue started. Can't get the spark to go. The gas continues to build. We finally get the spark, and we get this plume that builds, totally unsafe, I realize, and yet it still happens to so many of us that we know of someone who has had that kind of a story, and they come back with their hair singed, not even necessarily being touched by the flame for any length of time, but for a fraction, a fraction of a second. It, even before they were going into the furnace, before they were hurled into the furnace, God's protection was around them. Their robes were not scorched, and and there was no smell of fire on them. You know what that smells like. It's the Victoria Day long weekend. Many of you would normally be camping and sitting around the campfire and enjoying the wafts of the smoke of the fire, hoping that the smoke was actually going someone else's way, but the smell that's still there, and anticipating that in the joy of the evening and time spent together. 
I still remember when we were in Algonquin going to a store and they had a soap called Algonquin Morning. I didn't think it was the best, but it kind of gave you that reminder of that fire and smoke smell. They didn't even have that smell on them. They weren't even close enough to being affected by these flames to have that. Then, Verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. And so we here we have now a new decree to go against the decree we had at the beginning of the chapter. A new decree. He says, Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses turned into piles of rubble, for no other god can save in this way. It's a good thing this decree is not grandfathered because if you remember back in verse 15 the claim that Nebuchadnezzar made then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand well in fact the God of Israel the God of Jacob and Isaac the God whom we serve the God who saved us through the sacrifice of his own dear son who made a way to provide salvation for those of us who needed salvation from only that which God could save us. His own need for the debt of sin to be paid. A need that can only be paid by one who is truly human and truly divine. And he made that way for us in Jesus Christ. For no other God can save in this way. He is fully capable. He is fully able. Do we believe it? Because whether we believe it or not, it doesn't change who God is. It doesn't change what He can do. It doesn't change. But it changes how we are in relationship with Him. Do we trust in Him alone? Do we look to Him And put everything we have upon him. I gotta ask is there anything that we find ourselves in this COVID 19 time trusting more than God? The easy answer is to say no, absolutely not. Uh, But I gotta ask. Are we finding ourselves trusting that our salvation will come first and foremost by the doctors and nurses or by the chief public health officer, Teresa Tam? Or that it will come through the work and the decisions and the provisions that are coming from Prime Minister Justin Trudeau or from Premier Doug Ford? Are we trusting our salvation in them over and above the God of our salvation? Don't hear me say, don't trust these people. I want, to, I want you to know, trust what they are doing. Trust that God has put them in place to be just and right in what they do for the care of the people of our nation. What I am helping or wondering or asking is, have we found ourselves trusting them more than our God and Father? Have we gotten to the point where we think God has left us behind? Have we turned our face away from Him and decided to go our own way? This story reveals that even in the most dire of times and in a place and a time that's completely out of the normal, God is with His people. He is with you and I. And he is the God who saves. He didn't save Polycarp, but he saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There are many who have not been saved and have been 
killed for their faith. But the ultimate salvation that we have in Jesus Christ is that he has gone ahead of us as he has ascended on Thursday morning, he go, on Thursday, he goes ahead of us to prepare a place for us. Because that is our home. When our sojourning, our traveling, our journeying through this place comes to a close, we get to join him in our eternal home and worship God freely and openly because He is the God who saves. Amen. Will you pray with me? Father God, thank You for Your salvation gift to us in Jesus Christ. Thank You that You have saved us from our sins. Thank You for the confidence that You save us from COVID-19 that you save us from ourselves, that you save us from any illness, from any brokenness that can take place in this world. Because our salvation is in you. The gift of that salvation is eternal life. And so we pray, Lord, be with us in the journey of life through the times when we are in the fiery furnace. Help us to know that we are not alone, that you are with us protecting us, watching over us. We are yours. In Christ we pray. Amen. I'd like to invite you to join me. Uh, we're not going